Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, which will focus on the ACNC's external conduct standards one year on. We hope you're all staying, staying safe and well. My name is Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Matt Crichton. Hi, Matt. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, now, as always, super quickly, uh, some housekeeping points before we start. Uh, if you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. Call the number listed in the email you will have received upon sign up and put in an access code and listen to the webinar that way. You can also uh, type a question at any time throughout the webinar. We've got our colleagues, Robin and Jess and Matt, uh, helping us respond. We'll try and answer all of the questions that come through, but if your question isn't answered, please feel free to send us an email uh, and we'll get back to you. Uh, you can send those, uh, those emails to our education address, education at acnc.gov.au. Uh, a recording of this webinar, as well as the slides, uh, will be published on the ACNC website in the coming day or so. Um, and uh, as always, we'll send out an email with a number of the links that we'll, uh, we'll mention during this webinar, so you don't have to write everything down and, and scribble madly. We've also uh, sent through a handout um, with those links to those who have uh, registered for today's webinar. Finally, we value your feedback as always. Uh, if you've got any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, please let us know in the short survey at the end of today's session. So he says hitting a button and hoping it works. Let's see what we've got here. There it is. That makes me feel good. Now, what's on the agenda for today? Uh, we're going to firstly um, run through some, uh, I guess, some context on the standards, uh, what they are, what they cover, that sort of thing. Yes, we will. And actually, just before we move on to the, the rest of these um, to do lists, uh, just on the handouts, mm. if you didn't get that in the confirmation, email you i think you should be able to access it via the control panel and go to the go to webinar there so if you don't have yeah. them handy yeah. and you want them um you should be able to download them there there should be a little section called handouts okay yeah, there was two of them uh back back to yeah. back to our plan um <laughs> yes we will we'll look at some of the common questions and queries that we have received um about the external conduct standards and we'll provide some answers as well and point you all in the direction of some handy resources and other information that we have about um, complying with the standards. We we will devote a bit of time um, to looking at the, the external conduct standards in the current challenging climate. We know there are charities out there facing lots of challenges and we'll provide some uh, guidance and tips on how they can continue to uh, comply with the external conduct standards despite the current uh, difficulties. And of course, there are other issues that have arisen in the year since the external conduct standards were introduced. So we'll spend a little bit of time working through those and offer up some support and tips on them as well. Um, and to round things out, we'll, uh, we'll uh, sort of go through some quick tips and, and key messages and takeaways. And we'll, uh, with any luck, get to some questions that we can answer as well and, uh, and wrap things up. So, the external contact standards. The standards are a set of four standards uh, that set out how registered charities must manage their activities and resources and, and their people outside Australia. And they, they were introduced uh, this time last year as the, the, the title of this webinar suggests and they cover a few things. Um, the first couple here, they, they cover charities activities and control of resources which includes funds um, for use overseas. And this means the use must be in line with the charity's not-for-profit purpose and character, and the charity must have reasonable controls or, or policies in place for their use. Of course, and charities must follow Australian laws. They also cover an annual review of overseas activities and, and record keeping. Charities need to obtain records and, and keep them and they must the records must allow a charity to uh, prepare a summary of activities and expenditure um, on a country country by basis. They look also at um, or cover uh, anti-fraud, anti-corruption. Um, a charity has to minimise the risk of fraud um, and corruption um, when, when operating uh, overseas. 
um, and also manage conflicts of interest, uh, which is another important aspect of, of that, that standard. Um, they also uh, endeavour to protect vulnerable people. Um, charities have to minimise the risk of harm, uh, exploitation or abuse of, of vulnerable people. Um, as, as we can see, the external can, conduct standards have four key aims. Um, to ensure confidence in charities' work and their use of resources. Um, now that's money especially, but also other resources as well. To promote transparency and to promote uh, accountability. Um, and to, again, protect vulnerable people, be they uh, your people, um, the people working with you or, or for your charity, or the people your charity works with overseas. Now, the standards apply to all registered charities when they're operating outside Australia or working with a third party that is operating outside Australia. A couple of quick things here. Basic religious charities, they are not compelled to comply with the ACNC's governance standards, but they must comply with the external conduct standards. And third parties, just a quick explanation. Generally speaking, third parties are organisations or individuals that either formally or informally work with a charity. Now, uh, we realise that most charities have, have jumped in, they've done the right thing, they've ensured that they're meeting the standards and by doing so they've ensured that their governance, their operations and their work are all the best they can be. Okay, now a couple uh, more little explanations here. Operating outside Australia, as, as we show on the screen here, uh, means that charities undertaking activities that are overseas or, or even funding activities that are overseas. And it doesn't matter how small these activities are, they, they count as overseas activities and a charity is therefore in this sense operating outside Australia, even, even if the, the, the funds or, or the activities are, are really small. Um, and we've got example situations where the standards do and don't apply on a, a fairly comprehensive fact sheet on our website. Um, okay, we mentioned the word activities. We have mentioned the word activities a few times here, particularly overseas activities. Now, there are a number of activities that constitute a charity operating outside Australia and therefore um, means they have to comply with the external conduct standards. Chris, do you want to yeah, um, go through some of these? Yeah, uh, and I mean, as you can see here, we've 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 clicked through a couple of slides, and there are some examples here of of what it means to be operating outside Australia. Um, sending money or resources overseas is the first one. That's something obviously quite a few charities do. Now, the standards include specific um, mentions and provisions when it comes to charities sending money overseas. Uh, external conduct standard one, in particular. Uh, provide some clear guidelines and reference points. Uh, it's worth referring to that standard uh, to ensure that you know what your charity can do to make sure it meets the standards um, if it's just sending some money overseas. Uh, also, operating outside Australia encompasses sending staff, volunteers, members or, or beneficiaries, which are those who you, who you aim to help, uh, overseas. Okay, another one here, conducting activities overseas. Well, that, that's pretty obvious. Um, it also covers, I suppose that's the classic sense that we all understand, um, you know, having people doing stuff overseas as part of programs or projects that you've got um, happening in another country. Um, buying goods and services from overseas suppliers. Um, that's one that can easily be overlooked, but um, that can be classed as an overseas activity if, if um, the the purchases are linked to your charity's work in pursuing its charitable purpose. Um, working with individuals or organisations located overseas. Now we've mentioned third parties uh, a couple of minutes ago and generally speaking, working with groups or individuals located overseas, um, maybe to do some work in overseas communities or distribute funds or goods to those communities, that may be classes operating outside Australia too. And now with this whole list, we're, we're speaking um, quite generally, we understand that there may be some obscure situations or uh, some things on the very edges of these sorts of broader categories that may be a little bit harder to categorise or maybe harder to see whether or not the external conduct standards apply. It's worth um, in exploring it further if you feel your charity is doing one of those things. But generally speaking, these are the sort of uh, broader categories that would 
um, be encompassed by this phrase operating outside Australia. And and I guess to that end, um, we've got, as you can see here on the screen, there's there's three key sort of areas on our website where um, we uh, we would encourage you to go and have a bit of a look. Um, the first link here is to our external conduct standards page. Um, that provides a pretty easy to understand rundown of the standards uh, in an overall sense, as well as direct links to more detailed information about each of the individual standards. Um, that's a really good starting point. Um, the second link here on, 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 your, on your screens is a link to our guide on when the external conduct standards apply. This page is a good one because it provides quite a few practical examples of when they apply or when they may not apply. There are times where, as Matt just mentioned, things can get a little bit involved or a little bit technical. So we've spent some time um, to go through and, and to endeavour to explain thing in the, things in the plainest possible way on, on that page and provide some, I guess, practical examples of, of when uh, the standards apply or don't apply. The third link is to our self-evaluation tool. Look, this is a really useful one. It's something we'd recommend anyone, uh, any charity that has to comply with the, the external conduct standards has uh, at hand. It provides, look, a, a whole heap of practical steps charities can take to ensure they comply with the standards. It's a great reference point as well. Um, again, a copy of that tool has been included as a handout uh, for this webinar. Um, you can access it from that page on the web though. Um, file all three of these links away. We'll be sending out a follow-up letter uh, or email, sorry, after this webinar. Uh, it's going to include those links and others so you don't necessarily have to scribble everything down right now. Okay, um, some key issues. Now, um, in the year or so since the introduction of the external conduct standards, we, we've received a fair share of questions from charities, you know, about when they apply, what charities have to do to comply, um, those sort, sorts of things. We've learned a fair bit over the past 12 months about what charities are, are finding difficult and, and less so, I suppose. You know, we've gathered a few of the more common queries together here so we can offer you a bit more information and guidance that we think may be uh, particularly salient or, or practical for charities grappling with uh, some of these issues. I'll, I'll pass over to you, Chris, to kick these off. Mm. Um, look, again, and, and I mentioned before, and I mentioned again here, look, the way that charities have, have jumped in and, and taken the external conduct standards on board has been great. It's been really encouraging, um, very positive. Um, the way that they've integrated the standards into um, their planning and work um, ha has been again very positive. As Matt mentioned, as this webinar is going to detail, there have been some questions though and, and quite understandably as well. Um, first question here, um, we're a small charity that, that wants to send money overseas. Can we still do that? Now, that's one that we've received quite a number of times. Uh, Matt, the yeah, the answer, answer here, the answer's a pretty clear one. Out. Yes, definitely. Um, the, uh, your charity, of course, can still um, send money overseas. We, The last thing we want is for the external conduct standards to, to put a, a block in, in that sort of charitable activity. So of course the answer is yes, but it means that your charity does have to comply with the external conduct standards. And um, we'll have a look at what that means in this context. In, in this context that we're talking about, um, external conduct standard one um, emphasizes that money, you know, for example, sent overseas, needs to be used lawfully and in line with the charity's charitable purpose. So, it's important here that charities take reasonable steps to ensure that, that this is the case. Now, as you can see, we've, we've bolded the phrase reasonable steps here. Um, Matt, what, what are reasonable steps? Yeah, th this is one that um, can get a little bit tricky for, for people in charities trying to get their head around uh, the external conduct centres. Now, we don't dictate what specific steps charities must take. There's no prescription from the ACNC about this or, or the level of work that they need to do. Um, what, what we say is that charities um, need to take, or the steps that charities need to uh, take must be reasonable um, given their own size, their own capabilities and the scope of their work overseas. 
Now, for some large charities that have a lot of activities outside Australia, they're likely to need more comprehensive and, and maybe many more, char uh, many more policies to ensure that they are complying. But of course, for smaller charities, this is going to be scaled back a little bit, or, or charities that uh, don't have a lot of activity outside Australia. What they would consider reasonable in the context of their own operations would be very different. So this idea of reasonable steps um, might include some or all of these things, policies, procedures, um, approvals, processes for, for funding or sending money overseas, security checks, background checks of, of volunteers, staff, and, and that sort of thing, ongoing monitoring of projects, that sort of thing. But of course, back to this phrase, reasonable steps, all of this depends on your charity's work and, and precisely the, the scope of, of its overseas activity. So although it would be nice to offer a, a very clear prescription for every charity based on their work, it's it's not how these work and it is up to a charity to consider their own work carefully and consider how they would, um, uh, well, what would constitute reasonable steps for them in meeting the external conduct standards. Yeah, and, and look, it, some examples in, in this area perhaps to, to contemplate is things like checking the recipient of, of the funding. Um, you know, is it a, is another charity? Is it based overseas? Is it Australian based doing work overseas? Uh, what work is your charity funding? Um, you know, using secure monitored services when transferring funds, you know, formal banking systems, um, those sorts of things. Uh, asking recipients to confirm that, that they've actually received the funds. Um, obviously, continued updating uh, updates on, on the work and, and ensuring that your charity is on the ball uh, and knows what's happening. Uh, charities should ask for regular updates from the organisation carrying out the work. Um, and record keeping, uh, again, is, is, an, is another you know, key thing to, to consider. Um, you know, keep records of the amount of, of money that's been sent overseas, to which organisation it's gone to, and, and for what purposes it's it's been sent overseas. Um, we go to the we'll go to the next question here. We're a church that's a basic religious charity. Uh, we don't have to comply with the ACS, do we? Uh, Mash, do you want to break the news? Yeah. Um, the simple answer is yes, you do. And just before we get into <coughs> some of the details of this. I just want to clarify this idea of a basic religious charity. That that's a particular yeah. uh, charity category um, for ACNC registration purposes uh, or reporting purposes. So it's not that you just describe yourself as both basic and religious, and therefore that's it. There's actually um, a list of criteria that an organisation has to meet to be considered a basic religious charity. Now, this is a slight detour. There's a page on our website that has the full list of those uh, criteria and exactly what it has to be to be considered a basic religious charity. So if you're unsure, it's worth having a look at that. We'll include a link in the follow-up email. Um, yeah. But just to make it clear that we're not just talking about any charity that considers themselves both religious and basic. <laughs> it, it, is, it is about meeting a certain set of criteria. Uh, now, back to the answer to this one. Uh, which is yes, um, it's it is something that a basic religious charity will, will have to consider, and it's important not to write this off as um, uh, conducting activities overseas in, in the traditional sense of imagining you know people from your church working overseas in another country and, and conducting or projects or activities overseas. As we mentioned at the beginning, it does even include sending money overseas, even if the church in Australia doesn't have any people physically doing the work overseas. And in a sense, you know, we, we say obviously that basic religious charities do have to comply with the external conduct standards, but I guess from a, a higher level, I suppose it's more, it is important that basic religious charities actually do do this. You know, Institutions like these have long been part of, of a tradition of overseas support work and overseas efforts. Um, we, we see examples of that uh, now. We've seen examples of that all through the all through the years. Um, if 
these types of institutions are sending money overseas and, and, or have a charitable purpose that sees them working to help those outside Australia, then there are standards they have to uphold. It's, it's pretty plain, pretty simple. This is where the external conduct standards come into play. Um, you know, reasonable steps uh, to, to comply with the standards, to, you know, ensure the money, for example, that they send overseas is being used appropriately for, for a charitable purpose. Um, now, we, we mentioned reasonable steps again. Um, what are maybe some of the common things that, that can be thought about here, Matt? Um, yeah, reasonable, but again, depends on the, the situation, but some common things um, that a, a charity can do is, is um, keeping records, of course, which all charities should be doing anyway, but um, yeah. a particular focus on the records of um, the overseas activities in the broadest sense um, involved. Checking recipients of funds, so check in on the projects you're funding, check in on the organisations running the projects you're funding or you're contributing money towards. Um, ensure that, that your charity, or in this case likely uh, your religious organisation, um, has reports on, on activities and, and the work going on overseas. And importantly, um, are any vulnerable people involved? This is an important consideration and it's one that may be overlooked sometimes, particularly if your involvement is limited to sending some money overseas. It's likely that these sorts of considerations aren't going to um, pop up when, when discussing who to send money to, which organisations to send money to, but it's worth um, keeping this in mind. So consider the, the work of the organisation overseas and, and whether or not at any stage there are vulnerable people involved because you have some um, obligations uh, towards them. Okay, we'll have a look at the next one. Um, another common question we get here, I'll just uh, read it as you can too. We send only a very small amount of money overseas to further our work. Do we really need to comply with the external conduct standards? And once again, as you probably have guessed, the answer is, the answer is <laughs> yes. Um, and, and we'll add some clarification to that, to that short answer. Yeah, look, generally, you know, charity is considered to be operating overseas, even if its activities are only a minor part of its overall work, or if it involves only sending a small amount of money overseas, um, or the activities are being undertaken by another organisation on the charity's behalf. Um, and of course, if that's the case, if you are operating overseas, the external conduct standards apply. Next one, oh, hold on. Um, we work with another organisation to deliver our services and efforts overseas. What do we need to ensure? Now, um, there's a few things here. Uh, this isn't a yes or no one, this one. Um, the registered charity, the registered Australian charity, um, in this case, your charity, it must comply with the ECS, uh, sorry, the external conduct standards for its own activities overseas, as well as those of any overseas partner organisation. Now, you, we've used the term third party here a couple of times. Um, this is this is sort of what we mean when we when we talk about you know third party. Um, the charities have to be aware of of all the things that are happening through the, I guess we call it the supply line uh, of their work, the, the scope of its work, the work in its entirety. In doing so, they need to ensure everything is as it should be. Um, your charity shouldn't be looking to work with just anyone. Now, that's probably uh, common sense, but again, we, we emphasise that shouldn't be looking to work with an organisation or individual that isn't going to uphold certain standards either. Um, that's why charities operating overseas need to have that, that wider view, that supply line view, and, and need to take into account those third parties that they, that they work with. Yeah, um, and we don't, now, we don't want to make it sound um, uh, too onerous, but it, sh it would be part of um, a, a responsible charity's due diligence step, I suppose, in um, getting involved with some work overseas, um, no matter what extent that work is, whether it's 
sending people overseas or, or just money, as we mentioned. So being aware of all the, uh, I suppose, flow-on effects of being involved in uh, charitable work overseas is important and considering the, the as Chris described it, the supply line of your um, involvement overseas. And, but there is one thing, though. If the third party, as, as we've called them, that your charity works with is itself an ACNC registered charity, then of course it has its own obligations to comply with the external conduct standard. So it, it does differ slightly there depending on the partner organisation you've got. So um, in that way, you, your charity can ensure it's doing the right thing and and um, its, its partners are doing the right thing if, if it is working with um, a, another registered charity. Um, which has to comply with the external conduct standards itself. Um, next, next question that, that we've received, and it's it's one that has been quite quite common. Um, we are a small charity with a small amount of overseas activities. Um, we we are worried about how much work we'll have to do to comply um, with the external conduct standards. Um, now this is again we've we've mentioned through the the webinar here reasonable steps and 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 that sort of stuff what what's important to remember here is that that complying with the external conduct standards is is a proportionate thing um, every charity is different and we wouldn't expect a small charity to go through all the same processes the processes and steps that a large charity doing a lot of work overseas has to do the important things to remember here are uh, having a responsible and, and reasonable approach uh, and, an, and a, pro, a proportionate approach, depending on the size of your charity and the scope of its overseas activities. Um, also, the word reasonable is used here. Again, it's not a prescription from us as to what is reasonable. The need here is for the charity to, to consider what is reasonable in the context of its own work its activity, the scope of what it does, really scrutinise, really have a good think. Don't just don't just sort of glide along. Really sort of have a bit of a um, a bit of an examination of of what you do as a charity and and the work that you do overseas. And charities really should be, I guess, realising that they need to take some time to think about this and their own circumstances, so that they're response and so that their approach is is reasonable and responsible and proportionate okay um now of course at the moment charities are facing a lot of challenges as we're all well aware and that's um you know both work here in australia as well as overseas um now these things can all have a significant effect on uh, of course we're talking about the pandemic um, first and foremost, and it can have a significant effect on charities' work overseas. Um, so it's important here to recognise that the external conduct standards aren't, aren't just standards with which you must comply in a regulatory sense. They can be used as practical guidelines and in, in some cases starting points that can help your charity respond to the types of challenges or at least feel more assured that it's doing as much as it can to address the challenges it faces. Now, the the first challenge, the the first um, challenge that many of us <laughs> are facing at the moment, obviously comes through the the pandemic through COVID. Um, it's posing a major challenge for charities everywhere, including charities that operate overseas, um, and it's a challenge that wasn't foreseen. Uh, at the start of this year. Um, look, uh, the past couple of CNC webinars have focused on charities and the effects of COVID. Um, they're very good and handy general resources aimed at helping charities. We would recommend going and going to our webinars page on the ACNC website, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. Have a look, the March webinar and the July webinar have covered um, issues in relation to charities and COVID. Uh, as well as managing money uh, in the wake of, of COVID um, with charity, you know, looking at things like charity finances, uh, forecasting and budgeting and those sorts of things. Go and have a look at those uh, those resources. They're very handy. We also have a, a dedicated page still up on our website 
acnc.gov.au forward slash COVID-19. Um, that gathers together a lot of general information for charities. Uh, it continues to be regularly updated as well. Um, the charities operating overseas uh, would probably already, would most definitely already be looking at the impacts of, of the pandemic on their work. But with the ECS in mind, the expectation would be that your charity is looking after its people um, and, and its resources. Yeah, people, uh, yeah, so the, the pandemic is probably um, throwing this issue up in a, in a way that not many people expected once the, um, once, you know, the external conduct sense became a thing. But of course, external conduct centre four is one that deals with people most specifically and especially um, vulnerable people. Now, vulnerable people, again, is, is an interesting phrase here. Normally, we speak of vulnerable people as the, the people your charity is is established to try and support and offer services uh, to. And most certainly that does remain the case. But of course, the people um, involved in this may also be um, part of your charity. And um, they're, you know, they're volunteers, the, the staff, and they may be particularly vulnerable given the, the current circumstances. Um, so we've got a few points here you can look at and consider. Obviously, policies are needed, personal pol personnel policies, um, policies covering safety, that type of thing. Now, clearly, charities will already have um, these policies in place. Now might be a good time to review them, update them maybe, and, and revisit some of the statements in the policies. Again, there are some good ideas and prompts in the external conduct standard uh, resources, and in particular, the self-evaluation tool that Chris mentioned earlier. Um, so it's worth going to have a look at those um, to, to give, you, give you and your charity an idea of, of what may be needed now. Um, and, and further to that, um, other actions, again, um, do, is there a discussion that needs to be had in amongst your charity uh, about whether those projects or operations that need to be suspended or postponed uh, in the current environment so that people are safe? Um, do your people need to be withdrawn from certain areas, uh, pulled out of, of certain areas? If that's the case, how might this impact on those vulnerable people that you set out to help? Um, these are questions and these are things that you, you're going to have to think about. And, and look, from a, a very practical standpoint, we, we say protection here. We talk actual literal protection. Um, equipment for your staff or, or for those that you work with, you know, PPE uh, equipment, for example, uh, or even measures or protection in, in buildings or, or premises that they that they work in. Okay, some resources um, I, I, for this. I guess all three other external conduct standards do come into play, but a, a couple of points to think about. And think about the way your charity's resources, that, that, that is the funds, equipment, other items as well, are tracked and used. General good practice in governance dictates these things are, are used properly and responsibly, of course, but there may be changes in situations right now. And, and some of these, uh, one of the challenges is that some of the changes may be so rapid that it's, it can be hard to keep up. So it's important to uh, place some focus on that. Review the charity's work and, and what it's doing, as well as the policies that cover that work. Is the charity and its people adhering to the policies um, that are set in place? Do, do you need to update them? Do you need to alter them? Are there aspects of them that are um, somewhat irrelevant now, given the current circumstances and, and need to be um, fixed up to suit the situation that the charity currently finds itself in? And the, the last one on that list there, um, record keeping. Um, as, as we've said before, record keeping uh, is something that uh, your charity should be doing just as a matter of course and good, good governance, good operation, obviously. But if you're making you know, important financial uh, decisions or operating decisions, your record keeping needs to be on point, uh, needs to be tracking everything properly. Um, again, basic tenet of good governance, something that charities must comply with through the governance standards as well. Um, ensure the way you keep records uh, and, and record decisions um, is fitting 
to the current circumstances and actually allows you to keep track of things in, in the current situation. Um, the other thing about record keeping too, ensure the records are kept in a way where they're easily accessible for those who need them, they're easily understandable um, and, and uh, easily, I guess, read and, and used uh, where required. Now, the other, well, one other aspect of what COVID's uh, done, I guess, is um, it's placed a pretty big obstacle in terms of the limitations on travel. Um, these sorts of restrictions may predicate any actions your charity takes on top of those that are already set down through the external conduct standards. Um, it's important your charity is acting lawfully Obviously, if you can't travel somewhere, you can't travel somewhere, you've got to act lawfully. Um, and you have to adhere to those restrictions uh, and the restrictions, including those that, that might be on travel. Yeah, and if travel restrictions are having an effect, um, the, it, I mean, it might, there might be other uh, steps that it might have in place to, to um, help with decision-making processes or, Charity's approach to it, its work, its services, and, and the behaviour of its um, staff. So, for example, what will your charity do if its activities are in an area where no travel is allowed and, and people simply can't come and go easily? Um, what, what do you what do your policies say in this situation? How do you communicate this with your charity's people, whether that be um, you know its staff, volunteers, its beneficiaries, or even broadly to its supporters? Uh, can you continue um, the charity's work as usual or will you have to make some decisions on, on other ways to try and um, keep services going or possibly even suspend them? Um, okay, and, and of course, beyond uh, COVID, the external conduct standards and their um, uh, application overseas means that unrest in many parts of the world will, will affect charities' operations. The practical implications, of course, will depend on the area in which a charity works. Some are, you know, obviously more more dangerous than others, and will have a greater effect on how your charity will approach their work. Um, yeah, and to that end, I guess again we're looking at things like your know, preparation and procedures and, and clear communication. That's going to help your charity um, to obviously address any issues, but also to comply with the external conduct standards. Um, some of the, I guess, questions or, or, or talking points here is, is, will the unrest make it more difficult for you to get the job done? Um, will there be increased costs? Will there be increased danger to your people or to the people that you, you work with? Is there an increased uh, chance of corruption uh, or people overseas perhaps asking for, we'll call them extra considerations to allow you to continue to do your work. Um, will the unrest simply make it too hard for your charity to do its work at all? Um, again, there's no easy answers here. There's no blanket answers here. Each charity operating outside Australia will need to look at its own situation, the work it does, where it's operating. Um, these factors uh, to to ascertain, I guess, where it's got to go and the next steps that it has to uh, it has to take. The external conduct standards, however, they they can offer some prompts though. Um, you know, safeguard your resources, uh, keep good records, in, ensure your policies are adequate enough for your organisation to comply with the external conduct standards, as well as the governance standards. Yeah, again, and, and that self-evaluation tool, that external conduct standards self-evaluation tool that Chris mentioned a couple of times um, can come into play here as a, as a practical reference. Um, there are some practical ways to ensure your charity is meeting the standards and some of, the, some of them are quite simple actually and, and probably, well, we would hope um, the sorts of things charities are doing anyway, but we'll, we'll mention some of them here. So just keep abreast of events in the areas in which your charity is operating or has has operations, including set sending funds. Make, make sure your charity has procedures for helping staff in trouble, whether that be um, evacuations 
uh, flights back home or flights to other safe areas if, if needs be. Um, policies that dictate how it will pause operations or suspend operations if needed. Um, make sure the charity has adequate training and preparation. But this is probably more uh, relevant for organisations that send people overseas, I suppose. Make sure the people going that are adequately trained and, and prepared for the work they're doing in the country that they're going to be doing it. And increase the communication with people in, in an area. Um, ensure the communication is clear, comprehensive, and that uh, the, the people the charity works with, including its own supporters, its, its donors, uh, as well as staff and volunteers, um, have, a, have, a, have regular and two-way communication channels open with your charity. And of course, keep that vulnerable people uh, standard in mind. Look after the vulnerable people, whether they be your own staff or the beneficiaries um, at all times. And also with communication too, look at the ways that you communicate normally. Perhaps there needs to be different ways used as well. So consider the best ways possible to get messages and get important messages to the people you need to in the quickest possible time as well. Um, one issue that charities the world over uh, are experiencing and are face, facing is um, a reduction in donations and, and funding um, in the current climate. And I guess the question from a, a charity working overseas's perspective is, is, is the charity's work going to be affected by uh, a reduction in donations or, or fundraising? Um, again, we've talked about this issue in a couple of our previous webinars. Um, I would recommend going and having a look, particularly at the webinar that we, that we did in July that looked a lot at um, the work that perhaps needs to be done in a forecasting way and with financials when it comes to a drop in donations or fundraising uh, opportunities, that's well worth a look. Um, but yeah, a couple of, a couple of key points um, here. The, the ACNC governance standards and also the external conduct standards, obviously, they emphasise how important it is um, and they set in place as a requirement for, for compliance or as a requirement to remain a registered charity, um, aspects of proper financial management, financial reporting and, and record keeping. Um, so look, that's pretty clear. Of course, these types of actions are reflective also of overall good governance practices that, that any charity you know, should adhere to just as a normal way of, of operating. Yeah, and in these specific circumstances, there are other more, uh, there are other actions to consider. So maybe your charity needs to consider um, uh, something, some more planning about um, financial forecasting in in the coming months, given given what we've seen and the challenges that charities are facing in the in the first half of this year. And then, what sort of communications are you going to need to have with third parties, with with people overseas or partners? If there are going to be changes to the programs that you're involved in, um, are your charities plans? Uh, how are you going to communicate your char charities' um, strategic plans to everyone that needs to know? Um, okay, now we'll just move on to some, I suppose, top tips we've called them um, before we get to a few questions. Um, we've, we've got a few here. The sort of um, large takeaways um, th that may be useful if, if much of this has washed over you so far and there's been a lot of information, so it's certainly um, understandable if it has. But number one here, the external conduct standards apply to registered charities that operate outside Australia, even if those operations are small. And of course, we're speaking about operations in that really broad sense, which involves sending money overseas and some of those uh, less direct activities. The second tip that we've got is that, um, uh, I guess linked to that, is, is the importance of charities taking, again, the proportionate 
approach to complying with the external conduct standards. Um, the ACNC expects that charities take reasonable steps, there's that phrase again, reasonable steps, to comply with the standards. Uh, and again, very important, reasonable steps will vary for each individual charity. This is not a one size fits all. As we know, charities are all different. They are unique, they operate and do different things. Um, we don't want a cookie cutter approach. It's a, a an approach that needs to take into account the circumstances that are unique to each individual charity. Um, um, the third oh, point. You go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead. Oh, good. I'm just getting a roll on here. Um, the current circumstances that are facing charities that are operating overseas, it, it will probably see many charities facing new challenges um, or at least some challenges that are very different to what they may have expected even just six months ago. Um, it's important to remember that the, the external conduct standards aren't just a set of rules to abide by but that they are also very handy guidelines and very handy reference points that help uh, charities respond meaningfully to uh, challenges, especially challenges that they may be they may be facing now. Okay, and, and just the last one: that self evaluation tool is a really handy resource to keep um, one to do, and then to keep on record and um, review it and, and revisit it regularly to make sure your organisation is doing what it's supposed to do to meet the external conduct standards. Now, um, we've gotten near the end of our formal presentation, which is which is good and we're getting along towards the, the end of the hour here. Just a reminder that we're recording the webinar uh, and a recording as well as the slides, um, links, um, uh, an email out to you. They're all going to be coming to you in the, in the next day or so. Um, we will get in touch via email to ensure that you know that this uh, recording has been uploaded, that the slides and the presentation are available uh, and that there's some uh, links that you can go and refer to. So that's, uh, that's important. Um, feel free to keep an eye out for that email and, and click on those links and follow them through. We've got a couple of questions that have that have come in during uh, proceedings uh, here. Um, the first one is actually a, a pretty a pretty good one. Uh, it's one that again has been asked uh, about um, relatively commonly. Um, how the how the ACNC's external conduct standards, how they are linked to or related to the the ACFID, the Australian Council for International Development, their their code of or its code of conduct. Um, now, Matt, did you want to do you want to uh, sure. maybe explain the link here, Matt? Uh, yep. Um, put simply, I mean, we've got some comp uh, more detailed information on the website about this. But if a charity complies with the ACFID code of conduct, um, ACFID, that is, um, it's likely to be meeting the ACNC's external conduct standards by, by virtue of what that code of conduct requires a charity requires of a charity, and because full members of the of um, ACFID are required to meet these standards, it's likely that these organisations will also um, be meeting the external conduct standards. But, but of course, the two things um, you know, don't exactly map to each other perfectly. So which means that a charity may still need to do a few extra things to ensure they are complying with the external conduct standards. But, but of course, as we've, it's been a bit of a theme through today's webinar, that, that will depend on the charity's own work overseas. Um, the, the short answer is that uh, it's likely that if a charity is um, uh, complying with the code of conduct um, from ACFID, then it's likely that they're going to be meeting the external conduct standards. But we'll include a link in the follow-up email that has some um, more detailed information about uh, this. So if you if you've got um, if you want to look into it more deeply, then that that will be the place to go. Yeah, and there's there's actually a page on our website that maps the code of conduct and the external conduct standards and has a bit of a comparison, a bit of a discussion there. So that's, again, that's one worth bookmarking and one worth um, keeping in mind. We've gotten 
and receive. We actually have received some questions throughout today's webinar. We also got some queries uh, prior to today's webinar starting. Um, and we've touched on it and we're going to emphasize it again because we reckon it's pretty important. These questions have asked about specific measures, specific things um, that charities, their charity can do in specific circumstances um, or policies they should have in place to ensure that they're doing the right thing um, when it comes to the external conduct standards. Again, we I'll, you know, we'll we'll emphasize this again there isn't a one size fits all. Um, you've heard the words reasonable and proportionate being used throughout things today. Charities are different, each one is unique. Um, what is reasonable for one charity might not be reasonable for another. Measures put in place by a larger charity are again unlikely to be suitable for smaller charities. Um, measures put in place by a charity that has a lot of operations overseas are not likely to be right for ones that maybe just send a little bit of money overseas or have a small amount of operations. What we want to emphasise is when we say reasonable and, and proportionate, it isn't a prescription from us as to what's reasonable or proportionate. We want to ensure that charities have the opportunity um, to set in place measures that do the job for them and, and are right for them. Um, the need here in this context is for a charity to consider what is reasonable in its own context, um, in, the scope, in the scope of its activities, uh, what it does, where it works, who it's working with, uh, whether it's money, whether it's resources, whether it's activities. This is where the ECS toolkit, the, the, the checklist, um, comes into play. It's a great reference point, it's a great guide. It literally provides all manner of ideas and, and, and points and checklists and questions to prompt you and to help you with um, suggested measures your charity can take and some steps that your charity can take as you work through the toolkit um, there'll be times where you'll be able to very quickly figure out what works for your charity what's reasonable and what might not be reasonable so that's a bit of a prompt towards self-reflection I guess um, charities again needing to consider their own circumstances and and their own capabilities as well um, so that's very important and again we point you in the direction of the of the self-evaluation as well it's it's invaluable um, so go it's a handout here so you can access it you can also go to the website and download it from there as well um, now we've we got any we got any more Matt? Have we got um, I suppose there's one more that I think is worth yeah. uh, touching on before we wrap up um, uh, Someone asking about their charity um, being provided with an opportunity to do something, um, to do something more with their overseas work at very short notice. How uh, they, they're wondering how they ensure this type of situation is covered as part of the external conduct standards. Um, yeah, I can see how this could um, crop up. You're doing some good work overseas, and of course, through networks, which is the way many of these things may come about, and some more work or a new project suddenly comes on the radar. But in some ways, this isn't really much of a question about the external conduct standards as much as it, as it is about your own charity's existing policies and procedures. Um, your, your charity should already have in place the policies and procedures that would um, ensure this type of situation, that it can, it can still meet the external conduct standards within this type of situation that these policies would cover things like working with third parties, uh, the, the financial aspect, management of staff and volunteers, even decision-making processes, that, that sort of thing. So if a charity has these sorts of policies and procedures in place, um, and for an established charity that's been doing work overseas, you would, you would assume that that is the case. For newer charities just getting into this sort of work, it may be a little bit, um, take a little bit more time to think this through at the outset. But it means that you will be able to take on uh, new projects, new activities and work at short notice because um, within your governance structure, there's the there's the really clear, um, solid and, and working policies and procedures that will support you, support your charity in, in doing that. Now, um, that, that's probably, so he's looking at his, watch here and being accompanied by a barking dog <laughs> I do apologize we're all working remotely as you can quite obviously guess um 
that might be just about it for today. Um, what we'll do, obviously on the screen at the moment, you can see the ways that you can stay in touch with us, um, emphasize our e-monthly um, charitable purpose, which comes out and, and updates people about what's going on um, around the ACNC, but also obviously around uh, charities as well. Um, our webinars, our great podcasts, where you'll get to hear uh, more of Matt's dulcet tones, <laughs> um, chatting about all manner of things, uh, and our and our contact uh, there for our advice services, um, uh, our advice services email. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's who's tuned in today. Um, thank you to to Jess and to Robin and to Matt times two um, for uh, presenting, for answering some questions, for helping out. Um, we hope you enjoyed everything today. We hope that it was informative, uh, helpful. Um, again, keep an idea, keep an eye on our on our website and our webinars. Part of our website, uh, we've got a number of uh, webinars scheduled between now and the end of the year. So go have a look, see if you're interested in them. Sign up, register by all means. Um, again, thank you again for joining us. We look forward to catching up again in the near future. Have a great day and, and most importantly, stay safe. See you later.